This morning, we conclude our series of studies on the subject of revival as we have worked our way through several Old Testament texts. Throughout this study, we have seen that some things usually associated with revival are not, in fact, part of God's movement within his people. Uh, We've had to overcome some popular notions in order to correctly understand what revival is all about. And one of these common conceptions about revival is that it is a time of deep mourning and weeping. Consider this account from one of George Whitfield's revivals. Such a commotion was surely never heard of, especially about 11 o'clock that night. For about an hour and a half there was such weeping, so many falling into deep distress and manifesting it in various ways. The description is impossible. The people seemed to be smitten in scores. They were carried off and brought into the house like wounded soldiers taken from the field of battle. Their agonies and cries were deeply affecting. Now it is true that revival services usually end with an invitation for people to come forward and pray, either to commit themselves to Christ for the first time or perhaps to recommit themselves to the Lord if they have fallen away. In more recent times, this has been labeled the altar call. Uh, Back in the day, they actually had something called a mourner's bench. They always sat right up front because nobody normally sits there anyway. And that's where people could come and, and pray if they were under conviction. Now, I am not doubting the sincerity of these folks. I'm not doubting that God was moving within them. Repentance, even tearful repentance, is not foreign to revival. My point this morning is it shouldn't stay there. Too often, that's all that happens in revival. You only hear about the sorrow and the repentance and the tears that are shed. But I don't believe true revival leaves people in a state of sadness and sorrow. In our final message on the subject, we will see that in revival it is time to rejoice in the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 8 records one of the most joyful and spectacular celebrations of the work of God anywhere in the Old Testament. Most churches, and frankly most Christians, need a revival of joy. As Howard Hendricks observes, too many people do not enjoy the Christian life, they endure it. It's a grim scene. They really know nothing of the grace of God, that emancipation from the drudgery of living. Whether they're into legalism or license, they are slaves. It is only the grace-pervaded life produced by the Spirit of God that produces balance. The joy of the Lord is a biblical principle too little taught and too seldom practiced. Joy is like an untapped vein of rich fuel. God purposes for his children to have intervals of pleasure and enjoyment. Why do we insist on labeling fun as sin? If I dropped into your house or apartment, the place ought to be resounding with laughter. Often our homes are roaring, but it's usually not laughter. We have so much, and yet we have so little joy. We have entertainment options galore, but we have little joy. We have amusements of every stripe and variety, but little joy. We have options and opportunities that previous generations couldn't even dream of, and yet we have little joy. We are probably the richest society in the world, if not in history. And yet we are poverty-stricken when it comes to joy. Technological advances are exploding exponentially. But our hearts seem to recede in joy year after year. We have a flood of comforts, but a drought of joy. How can this be? And it's especially galling to see that in our churches. Churches. 
Our churches have more than ever before. We have the state of the art everything at our disposal. And yet, so many churches, so many Christians are poor when it comes to joy. Now, you say, what are you talking about with joy? It's, it's hard to really define. It might help to clarify what joy is not. Joy is not how you feel. Joy is what you know. Joy is not what happens to you. That's happiness. Joy is how you see what happens to you. Joy is not something you work up. Joy bubbles up from the inside. Joy is not determined by your circumstances, but by your convictions. Joy is not something to be obtained, but it is a flow of life to be entered into. Now, I'd like you to turn, if you haven't already, to Nehemiah chapter 8. I realize that Nehemiah is found in about the middle of your Old Testament, but that's a bit misleading. The events that take place in the book of Jeremiah happen at the end of the Old Testament era. In fact, if our Bibles were arranged chronologically, Nehemiah would be the next to last book of the Old Testament. Only Malachi would follow him. Malachi came about 20 years after Nehemiah. We have seen that at this point in history, the Babylonian exile of 70 years has ended. And Jews were allowed to come back to their homeland and rebuild the capital city of Jerusalem once again. But it was not one mass exodus of Jews that all went at the same time. There were actually three returns that we read about in Scripture. The first we covered last week. This was under Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Judah at this time. It happened in 536 B.C. And his objective was to rebuild the temple. Now, you may remember that when the people got back, they were all excited. They got the foundation done. And then the excitement kind of waned. And they let it sit for 16 years until God raised up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to spur the people on to get back and finish the job, which they did in 520 B.C. Now, about 80 years after the original return, the scribe Ezra led another group of Jews in 457 B.C. This return is described in the book of Ezra, which is right before Nehemiah, chapter 7 through 10. Now, there's no doubt that Ezra was a very godly man. Uh, we are told that he had an unusual ambition. His aim in life was to study, to practice, and to teach God's laws. He was what you might say the first Bible scholar in that sense. But I want you to notice, he not only wanted to study it and teach it to others, he wanted to live it. He wanted to put it into practice. Many preachers aim to study and to teach, but to do the will of God really sets Ezra apart. And then the third return came under Nehemiah uh, in 445 B.C., about 12 years after Ezra had returned. Nehemiah came, and he also had a mission. His mission was to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. Nehemiah had been a very high-ranking member of the Persian king Artaxerxes' court. He was described as the cupbearer. Now, the cupbearer was not just someone who drank everything before the king so that if it was poisonous, he would die instead of the king. The cupbearer was a very close confidant and advisor to the king. Uh, in our culture, we might liken it to a cabinet position or maybe the national security advisor to the president where it almost is right-hand man. But when Nehemiah heard about the conditions of Jerusalem, he asked permission to go back and rebuild the walls, and he was given that permission. And this first section of the book of Nehemiah talks about his return. After he had been in the ruined city for only three days, he formulated a plan. 
He mobilized the people that were there. They got to work on the walls. And even despite opposition from enemies, they finished the job in 52 days. Less than two months, they had all the walls built around the city of Jerusalem. Now here in chapter 8, we see a great spiritual revival that happens among the Jewish people. And it was a revival marked by joy. Joy in the word of God, joy in the worship of God, and joy in the ways of God. First, we see joy in the word of God here at the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, as I mentioned on our scripture reading, you really begin with the last portion of verse 73 of the previous chapter. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the law had commanded for Israel. Now in the next verse, verse 2, it says, the first day of the seventh month. If you were to translate that into our calendar, it would come out October 8th, 444 B.C. That's when this revival began. Now if you were to look back a couple of chapters... In Nehemiah 6.15, the walls were completed on the 25th of Elul, which works out to be October 2nd of 444 B.C. What does that tell us? Less than a week after the building project was done, they gathered to worship. There was no letdown. There was no, oh, man, I'm glad that's over with. I need a vacation. You know, I'm going to Disney. I, I'm, I'm headed to Arizona, or I'm going someplace. I'm getting out of here. And that often happens with churches after a big building project. Now, that only lasted two months. Oftentimes, these projects last a lot longer. And, and it's fatiguing. It's tiring. It, it surprises me how many preachers leave a church after a building project is done. I think for a, a lot of them, they're just exhausted. But here, less than a week after the building is done, let's gather for worship. And what was that worship centered on? The word of the Lord. Bring out the book of the law. Bring out the scriptures. And what this t teaches us is that after reconstruction, there needs to be a time of reinstruction. We need to make sure that we don't get too far away from the book. I believe that it is proper to have a building for the purpose of worship. I was at a church that lost their worship facility, and that church died in short order. I think it is important to have a building where people can gather and worship the Lord together. But the emphasis cannot end with the building. The building is not the focal point of worship. God's word should be. And that's what happens here. We need to be re-instructed. We need to be informed of God's ways. And the only way you can do that is through God's word. There's a New Testament counterpart to this, Romans 12.2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? by the renewing of your mind. How are we transformed as Christians? It begins right here. It begins with what we think, what we know. And then based on what we know, that's going to affect the decisions we make. And the decisions we make is going to affect how we feel. That's the order it should go. We need to be instructed in the mind of the Lord through his word. Now, this is the first mention of Ezra in the book of Nehemiah. But we know from the book of Ezra that he's already been there a dozen years. And he has been studying the scriptures. He's been teaching the people. We would say Ezra's been having church this whole time. But for some reason, this is different. What makes this 
different? Did Ezra finally preach a decent sermon? Is, is that why this was different? Now, I don't think the difference was in the preacher. I think the difference was in the people. Because if you will notice in verse 1, they told Ezra to bring out the book of the law. The people wanted to hear Ezra proclaim God's word. I want you to imagine a rock concert. And it's a packed house. And the people are excited to hear their performer, their band come out. And the people start chanting, We want Ezra. We want Ezra. Bring out the Bible. Now, I know that's hard to picture, but that's kind of the idea here. These people wanted to hear God's word being preached. It was something within their own hearts. And these people were serious. They weren't there to be entertained. They meant business. But they looked forward to hearing from God. I think that's an essential beginning for true revival. We need to hear. We need to want to hear from God. There needs to be a hunger and a thirst for God's word. In any genuine revival throughout history, two major thrusts have always appeared. First, there's been a proclamation of the word of God. And there's been a mobilization of the people of God. You see, revival doesn't really have to do much with the unsaved. You can't revive what's never been alive. You can only revive that which has been alive, but has lost its oomph, has lost its, its vigor. And revival occurs as God ignites the fire of his word and mobilizes his people through the Spirit of God. But what we find is when God's people get away from loving, reading, and obeying the word of God, they also lose out on the blessing of God. The Bible says if we want to be fruitful trees, we must delight in God's word. It must be something we want to do. And something that is striking about this incident, even though it comes at the end of the Old Testament era, from this point forward, the Jewish people became people of the book. God's word meant so much to them from this point on. Previously, the prophets would come and say, thus says the Lord, and the people would yawn and say, whatever, I'm going back to bed. They didn't care, but from this point on, they do. God's word has its proper place in the life of the people. And I am convinced there will be no revival, there will be no spiritual life at all without the proclamation of God's word. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says the primary task of the church and of the Christian minister is the preaching of the word of God. The decadent periods of the eras of the history of the church have always been those periods when preaching had declined. This is where it begins, on the foundation of God's word. You'll notice uh, in this passage, Ezra stood on a wooden platform. It was like a pulpit. And it was elevated so that all the people could see him. He probably spoke uh, close to the walls that had just been completed, which was like a sounding board so that everybody could hear. Now, after he opened the scroll, it says, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. In many churches, there's a blessing after God's word is read. Why not before? (laughs) Acknowledging that this is God's word. In some churches, the people stand during the reading of the word. In other churches, they have a, 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 a saying of praise before it is read and after it is read. And the people said, Amen. See, it's okay to say Amen in church. Right here it is in the Scripture. You can do that. It's okay. The walls won't fall in. Lightning won't strike. It's okay to say Amen. Let's practice on three. One, two, three. Amen. All right. Now you've all done it. You can do it at any time. Amen means, so be it. We acknowledge God's word, and we want it in our lives. 
Then Ezra read aloud from the scriptures from daybreak till noon. Think about that. Five or six hours. Ezra proclaimed the word of God. I'm pretty sure my dad learned how to preach from Ezra. No. <clears throat> but he would have enjoyed it. He, he was kind of a throwback. He loved to hear preaching. And never once do I think my dad ever look at his watch and say, man, is this guy ever going to get done? They had a hunger for the word. And they stood the whole time out of reverence for God and his word. They listened attentively. Boy, could you imagine that today? I mean, after 30 minutes, people are like, Man, doesn't he know the bears kick off at noon? Let's get going here. We want to beat the Baptist to the buffet. Let's go. We get get some good seats, right? But you know, even in this day and age, if you go to different parts of the world, people respond like this. I have heard area ministers that have gone into far places on our planet where the word of God is not as easily available, where there aren't churches every other corner. And as they maybe have flown for hours across several time zones, they've got jet lag, they're tired. They arrive at the airport, they get driven to the place where people worship to find hundreds, even thousands of people that have walked for miles because they heard that there's going to be preaching of the word. And they may get up there and, and preach for 15 or 20 minutes and think, well, that ought to be good because that's how good it is in America. And the people are like, uh-uh, you're not done. We want more. It's like an encore. More, more, bring them back out. We want more. And it's not until they've heard an hour or two, at least, that they're satisfied. And then the next day they come back and they want more. That's what was happening here in Ezra's day. He had never heard what we often call the preacher's beatitude. Blessed are the brief, for they shall be heard again. That's how we tend to be in, in our culture, but not here. Now, I have adopted Nehemiah 8.8 8 as my own personal job description as a preacher. They read from the book of the law of God making it clear and giving the meaning so the people could understand what was being read. One of the greatest compliments I've ever heard about my preaching was, you make God's word understandable. That tells me I've done my job. Have you ever been in a sermon or been in a church service where the preacher preached about two feet above your head? You walked out saying, what did he just say? I have. I, I've, been in, I've been in churches where the preacher gets done, and I don't have a clue what he just said. No idea. What do you call spending a half an hour, an hour in church when you have no idea what the preacher said? I call that a waste of time, and time is too precious to waste. If we're going to hear from God's word, you need to understand. And the first rule in correctly interpreting scripture is you need to know what it meant then before you can know what it meant now. So that's why you'll hear me refer to the history, to the culture of the time. Sometimes we get into the original language so that we can clearly understand what it meant to the people when it was first written. And now we can understand what it means to us today. That's exactly what Ezra did here. Clarity should be the goal of every preacher and every sermon. Because it's clarity that changes lives. Look at verse 12. The people went away with great joy. Why? Because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. Understanding changes lives because change starts with the mind it starts with how we think and if we don't know we can't grow so that's the the role of the preacher to declare God's word in a way that people can understand it 
The Bible is not some magic book that if you recite some words and some lines, it's going to change things. It is only as God's word is understood that it can enter the heart and release its life-changing power. And you'll notice six times in this passage, the word understanding is used. It's very, very important. When revival comes, we find joy in the word of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 162 states, I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great treasure. Psalm 112, 1, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. And Psalm 1, 2 says of the blessed individual, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. Joy of the Lord comes with the understanding of God's word. Secondly, people found joy in the worship of the Lord. Look at verse 9. Then Ezra the governor, or Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy. Why? Because they now understood the words that had been made known unto them. See, when God's word is proclaimed and heard with a fresh outpouring of God's Spirit. It is clear, it is compelling, and it is convicting. And you'll notice the first response of the people was grief. As they heard God's word proclaimed, they were convicted by what they weren't doing or the things they were doing they shouldn't be. And God got a hold of them. And with that conviction can can produce tears of repentance. It can produce deep emotions like mourning and weeping. But I want you to notice the worship leaders did not allow the people to stay in that state. They did not allow them to wallow in their sorrow. Three times in this short text, it's pointed out that God's grace and gloom Don't mix for any length of time. They said, do not grieve. This is a day to rejoice. Don't live in grief and gloom. Live in grace. And let that grace produce joy. J.I. Packer points out, grief for sin and joy in God's forgiveness and the assurance of his love are not far from each other. For the God who convicts of sin is the God of mercy who saves. And repenting of sin and trusting Christ for forgiveness are two sides of the same coin. Not all service of God needs to be somber. Where do we get this notion that Christians have to be serious all the time? I mean, how many people walk around and say, I'm spiritual, see? They're trying to impersonate Grumpy Cat or something like that. Since when does our spirituality measured by the downward droop of the edges of our mouths? Why do we have to be known as the people that are always dull and boring? You know, they can't have any fun because that's sin. And we walk around looking like we've been sucking on sour lemons. And we go to people and say, I'm a Christian. Don't you want to follow Jesus too? And we wonder why nobody does. Where did we get that idea that seriousness is next to godliness? I don't find it. In fact, the scripture is full of the joy of following God. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it to the full. Have it abundantly, 
James begins his letter, count it all joy, my brothers. And he's talking about when you're experiencing tough times. Our lives should be marked with joy. Now, I'm not talking about pasting a goofy grin on your face that's not real. Joy is the most realistic thing we have. Because joy understands that, yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I have done and said things that are wrong, and there's a lot of good things I haven't done. But the grace of God forgives every sin. And we need not carry that burden around. God's grace releases us. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you should be free indeed. Why do we walk around as though we're enslaved? As though we are, have always lost our best friend? Our worship should be based on the Word of God, and the Word of God says the joy of the Lord is your strength. What is it that's going to get you through the tough times? It's the joy of the Lord. Because joy is not dependent on our circumstances. We have joy regardless of what's going on around us because of what God has done within us. And that can't change. And we should express that kind of joy. Now, yes... God's word at time will bring conviction. It's going to make us feel bad about things we're doing or not doing. But conviction is like pain. Pain is telling you something's wrong. Get it checked out. People who live with constant pain, without having it checked out and without doing something about it, they are not strong. There's something else that begins with the letter S. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. There's no need for it. So if you are feeling conviction by the Spirit of God because of something that's wrong in your life, fix it. It's very simple. Confess it. Repent of it. Move on. Don't carry it around like a ball and chain. We have been released of that, and we can get back to being joyful. Warren Wiersbe writes, It is as wrong to mourn when God has forgiven us as it is to rejoice when sin has conquered us. We should be people of joy. Our worship should be joyful. It should be positive. It should invigorate us. I don't know if this happens to you, but every, for me, it's very, very rare, but when you miss a Sunday, maybe you're ill, maybe you're traveling, maybe the weather's such that you got to cancel church. Anybody else have this experience where you're off the rest of the week? I don't even know what day it is if I haven't been in church on Sunday. It just throws off everything. Worship should be the centerpiece of our life. And it should be something we look forward to. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. When your alarm went off this morning, was your reaction, good morning, Lord? Or was it, good Lord, it's morning? Right? And I've had people say to me, I really didn't feel like coming to church today. But, but I, I just made myself do it. I'm so glad I did. I've yet to hear anybody say, I really didn't feel like coming to church today, and now that's done, I wish I'd have stayed in bed. At least I hope I never hear that. You folks are probably too nice to say it, even if you did feel it. But being in God's house, worshiping the Lord, hearing God's word, ought to bring us joy. Now, the last thing, and we won't get into it in detail, but if you read on verses 13 through 18, you'll find the people found joy in the ways of God. After that initial worship service, 
that five or six hour sermon wasn't enough. They came back the next day and said, we want more. And Ezra began to preach again. I'm guessing he was preaching from Leviticus 23 because they discovered something they hadn't been doing. It was something called the Feast of Tabernacles, and you can read it to get all the, the details about it. But it was one of the celebrations the Jews were supposed to do. They hadn't been doing it. And, and immediately they said, well, let's do it. <laughs> they don't say, ah, we haven't done that forever, so it doesn't matter. God says we should do this, let's do it. And they went and they got all the, the branches and everything they needed. They built these little booths. It was kind of like a camping trip. You camped out for a week remembering what it was like in the wilderness wanderings that you know that was the whole the whole reason but what what was so great about this verse 17 the whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them from the days of joshua son of nun until that day the israelites had not celebrated it like this the words like this are very important doesn't mean they hadn't celebrated just had not like this why the last phrase and their joy was very great. When we get serious with God, we're going to find that our Christianity is not just for Sundays. It's not just coming to church for an hour or so. It's a livelihood. See, the Bible doesn't just tell us how to worship. It tells us how to live. And the ways of God transcend Sunday morning. And it affects the way we live throughout the week, throughout our lives. But when we get serious with God, we'll find that the ways of God are joyful. Life is not dull as a believer. We find joy in everything. Our life will be a delight, not a drudgery. Old Bible commentator Matthew Henry wrote, Holy joy will be the oil to the wheels of our obedience. Not only will we endure the Christian life, we'll enjoy it <laughs> on a daily basis. It is time to rejoice in the Lord. You know, throughout the Bible, we're commanded to rejoice because rejoicing is not something you feel, it's something you do. And it's something you need to do whether you feel like it or not. Rejoice! Praise God for what He has done. Thank him for what he has given to you. Obey him, whether you feel like it or not. And remember, the primary change in this revival did not happen in the preacher. It happened in the people. And that's where true revival begins. The change took place when they came together and expected God to do something when his word was proclaimed. What would happen in our day if people spent as much time preparing their hearts for worship as the preacher spent preparing his message? How about this? What would happen if we spent as much time preparing our hearts for worship as we did getting dressed on Sunday morning? What do you think might happen? We might just have revival. May the Lord revive us again.